Hello, welcome. Thank you for joining us. I'm Tim Carney. I'm a resident fellow here at the American Enterprise Institute. Thank you for joining us for this hour long discussion. I have with me Ian Marcus Corbin. Ian is a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard Medical School. He's there now. Um, you don't have to call him doctor, even though he's got his, his okay. doctorate and he's in the hospital. Um, or at least I don't have to call him doctor. He's a co-director of the Human Network Initiative there, um, and he's a senior fellow at Capita, a relatively new uh, think tank dedicated to trying to figure out how we can help families and, and children in, in these interesting times. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So capitalism, all of that stuff has been great for making the world richer, for making America richer, for making things move seamlessly around the country, around the world, for allowing us to move seamlessly wherever we want. Um, that might or might not always be a good thing, especially if we believe that the real good in the world is not simply measured in dollars and cents, is not simply measured in prosperity, or even in the other things we can measure um, easily, but is, is located uh, in family and community and that sort of thing. This was part of what I argued in Alienated America. And you can see Ian addressing these issues. I believe the event description included um, uh, his, his recent uh, long essay, uh, How Money Culture Hurts the American Family. His recent New York Times op-ed got lots of attention about the virtue about how uh, the virtue of weakness and overcoming shame. So Ian's going to share some of his thoughts on these issues. He and I are going to discuss it, and we're going to invite you guys, um, and I'll explain how in a little bit to send in your comments. But Ian, thank you for joining us. And why don't you well. tell us what you have to say? Okay. <laughs> well, thanks so much, Tim. Um, you know, I've been reading your book in the past couple of days, and I can see we're concerned about a lot of the same stuff. So this is this is perfect, and I'm really delighted to be here. Um, so I'll start by just telling a, a kind of brief kind of historical story, and then we can we can jump into discussion. Um, so a lot of the the problems that you and I see about um, alienation and community in America and the, and the breakdown of, of good things like uh, civic participation. Um, these are, are symptoms of a, uh, a set of issues that is just not new, that is at least as old as modernity. Um, so ever since people kind of got gathered from villages into cities to work in factories, there's been this undercurrent of kind of um, unhappiness about some of the things that that does to us. Um, and there's been this, this tradition of complaints that sort of modern urban industrialized life makes us into these cogs in our public lives. Um, you know, you reference the management theorist Frederick Taylor in your book, um, who at the beginning of the 20th century um, kind of worked out these ingenious ways um, to increase uh, efficiency in, in factory production. And in the process, it was, you know, he required that workers basically be turned into these sort of interchangeable monads who like, you know, could be fit into different parts of the process, who are just enthusiastic and competent. Um, and, and a lot of these forces, um, these sort of modern industrialized uh, forces kind of do ask us to make ourselves into these sort of interchangeable cogs without particular loyalties or attachments uh, or limits. Um, so there's a number of steps to this. You know, first there's like leaving the village and, and going to the city, to the factory, like, you know, back in, in history. Um, mm -hmm. There's been this, uh, this move to shrink the family down um, to a single breadwinner nuclear family, which makes the family more mobile. You can kind of move around and chase opportunity, um, to kind of not, not beholden to any, you know, broader communal attachments. Um, and then in the more recent past, the change to the two breadwinner family that makes, um, you know, at least for a lot of families, you know, every adult in, in the house is sort of like, again, like another cog in, in some sort of, um, you know, commercial machine. Um, okay, so this, is, this has been long running stuff. Um, after the Second World War, we start to get uh, the technology and the policy environment that allows for uh, more efficient offshoring Know, better automation and stuff like that. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of the kind of communal breakdown that you talk about in alienated America is pretty deeply connected to that, to the shutting down of factories, the offshoring of production, things like that. Um, 
as the seventies move into the eighties, we also get the rise of, of an ideology called shareholder primacy, um, which argues, and, and Milton Friedman, I think is the first real proponent, um, but which argues that the way to think about commerce, really the only way to think about commerce is that it exists to, um, to raise shareholder value. So if I'm thinking about how much to pay my employees, where to put my operations, what to do with like the toxic sludge that we produce, really there's sort of one final um, currency that I can sort of use to decide between these different options. And that is, is it going to increase or decrease shareholder, shareholder value? Okay, so, you know, this is, I'm telling this quick and dirty and obviously it's, it's maybe a, a little bit exaggerated. Um, but these trends, insofar as they exist, I think they tend to produce a sort of hardened, low trust, low solidarity public sphere, because why would I trust, right? Like, I understand myself to be an interchangeable cog. And so why would I feel, lo why would I feel uh, loyalty? Why would I feel solidarity? Um, I think that um, the, the post-war boom that we saw in America, both economically and in terms of civil society, kind of tended to paper over some of this stuff, right? When you have that kind of growth, when you have that kind of social mobility and opportunity, um, when you have that unusual level of civic participation that the greatest generation engaged in after they got back from the Second World War, um, you might not notice some of this anime and some of this alienation. I think something that I've been thinking about lately that's really interesting is this this period of incredible prosperity gave rise to like a, an incredible rebellion, right? So the 1960s, like the baby boomers, totally rebelled against all of this prosperity, right? And they, they sort of wanted something more authentic. They wanted sort of true and deep belonging, right? They, they didn't feel like they were getting in that prosperous post-war period. They wanted to leave their idyllic hometowns, get in VW bugs and find them, buses and find they them. Wanted, yeah, they wanted something realer than like, like their parents' intense embeddedness in these communities, you know, great material prosperity, et cetera. So, you know, that move towards authenticity and sort of individualism, um, individualism in service of a kind of deeper kind of belonging, ideally, um, it ends up getting privatized. <coughs> and those, those trends kind of uh, are, are still now pretty operative, I think, in the, the realms of, of sex and marriage and, and things like that. Um, now, the way it turns out and what I've been trying to think about and what I explored in, in the, especially the, the recent Plow essay is that that private breaking up is actually quite good for public commerce, right? Mm -hmm. For our sort of public economic lives. Um, because if you want sort of growth year over year across sectors, um, you're gonna need to make more needs, right? I'm gonna need things next year that I didn't need this year, right? And like, I only need so many pairs of shoes and, and so many apartments to live in. Um, and so one way to kind of goose demand is to, is to have a sort of lonely, needy, alienated population and then convince them that with these new experiences, these new products, like finally they'll feel whole again, right? Um, so I think it's really interesting to look at the fact that like in the past you know, 10 years, most of the growth in our economy has been driven by the, the so-called FANG companies. So Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Google, and Netflix. Um, and a lot of those, a lot of what those companies are selling is connectivity, right? You get pulled online in this is mm -hmm. sort of desperate yeah. search for connection. And then while you're, you know, revealing yourself in various ways and trying to connect, they're collecting just massive, massive amounts of data about you so that they can more efficiently convince you that you'll be less lonely if you finally buy this thing. Um, and then, it, and I'll, I'll end with this, um, the, you know, my American Purpose piece, which I, I published recently, is, is a, about a solitude and solidarity. And I think that um, one thing that's happened is this kind of manic pursuit of connection through all these, these various digital um, forums, um, it actually crowds out authentic solitude in our lives. Like we're very rarely alone with our thoughts. Um, something that Aristotle says when in his description of friendship is that you can't really be friends with other people if you're not friends with yourself, 
Um, you kind of need that time to kind of absorb what's happening to you, kind of face yourself, come to terms with your limits, your vulnerabilities, your weaknesses, and then you can move, back, you know, move in a sort of more candid and honest and authentic way into friendship with other people. Um, so I think that, you know, where I end up in the plow pieces, there, there is this sort of increasingly, you know, um, integrated, effective culture that sort of is making us, keeping us lonely, and it's very good for the economy and not that good for us. Great. Um, I agree with some of that. I'm skeptical of some of that. I'm going to encourage everybody. Um, two ways to submit questions, comments, that sort of thing. Uh, one is email uh, Nicole Penn. That's uh, Nicole.Penn with two N's at AEI.org. Or um, on Twitter, you can ask a question um, if you post with the hashtag AI solidarity, uh, solidarity is a good, uh, good Catholic word there. I approve again, AI solidarity is the Twitter hashtag Nicole.pen at AI.org is the email. Send in your questions. We'll, we'll get to them later. But so I'm a, I'm a conservative guy. And so one of the worries I always have when I'm thinking of arguments that I like is do we have a, a mistake of sometimes creating a false golden age? And so we always have to be self-critical of that. You read Charles Murray's Coming Apart and the day before JFK is assassinated is sort of the everything is right. This is also the way they write movies, right? Like everything's going normal and then the bus blows up. Yeah. Um, uh, some people say Occam's razor was when the bus blew up. Uh, in Alienated right. America, I set like the golden era for, you know, white guys with no college degrees, and 1955 in Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. specifically because they had a factory job. So now you're, that's already fallen in your world. And um, the agrarian past is your sort of um, golden era is, mm -hmm. uh, is one Probably, provocative yeah. way to put it. <laughs> um, so, I mean, didn't the farmers wanna not be farmers? They weren't they getting you know uh, backbreaking labor and, and losing half of their children to diphtheria and and that sort of thing. What's I want you to just put a little more flesh on what's fallen, what was better. Mm. Is this just a golden era tale? Um, yeah, no, I, I think it would be foolish to say that that was a golden era. Um, I think there were. Yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of Charles Taylor, the philosopher, and he always says there's no social world that we could realize that doesn't entail a loss. Um, and so I think where it's, it's trade-offs at every step. Um, mm. And I think that it's not necessarily true that, um, you know, when you see a large scale change, like a move from village to city, that what you're just seeing is sort of rational actors sort of maximizing their utility and making the best choice for them and their families. There are like forces that sort of impel them, right? And there are things beyond their control and they might make choices as we all do that they would ideally not like to make. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think like I'm pretty, pretty happy about a lot of the fruits of modernity. I'm glad that infant mortality is as low as it is in a lot of countries. Um, I'm glad that, um, I, my family and I have the sort of material comforts that we do. And a lot of that is absolutely due to modern and industrial, industrialized society. I don't think there's any serious um, proposals on the table that we just somehow swing back, <laughs> right? We burn it all down and just move back to the villages. So I think the job for us, and I'm d dodging your question a little bit, the job for us is just to make the present humane. Um, and mm -hmm. the present is a sort of modern, financialized in America, kind of deindustrializing present. And we need to think of how to make that okay for people. Okay, I, I'm glad you said that. And we will talk about specific uh, proposals you have, including one, which is to pay my wife to stay at home. But again, we'll, we'll get to that later. Um, you say make it more humane. Um, a lot of the things that our money culture, the uh, one of the phrases you use there, um, capitalism, and then even the welfare state and these things aim at reducing. Are, I'm going to use three words that you use in, in some of your recent essays, friction, mm -hmm. weakness, and interdependence. And you use all three of those as good things. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, friendship is supposed to be difficult and awkward and, and frictionful is one of the things you argue. Weakness 
um, is something we shouldn't be ashamed of. We all have, and we need to highlight more. Maybe I'm putting the wrong words in your mind. And sure. interdependence. Autonomy is a major goal of um, a lot of the cultural left mm -hmm. and certainly the, the economic right. Self-determination. Yeah. And this is, you know, embedded in the enlightenment that we should be able to determine who we are. Mm -hmm. A lot of times that's held up as the highest good is autonomy and self-determination. And right. your sort of phrase of friction, weakness, and interdependence, are you <clears throat> the sort of, the critique of this is you want life to be harder because then people will choose the things that you think are best rather mm -hmm. than the things that they think are best. No, I mean, I think that, um, you know, any, almost anything that I'm proposing, it could, could happen while leaving our sort of macro structures roughly intact, right? Like, I think that we can choose to, like, have the difficult conversations. We can choose to not rely too much on social media for our social lives. Mm -hmm. um, we can choose to admit to one another when we're, you know, weak and afraid. Um, you know, in the example of the stroke patients that I use in the, in the Times piece, um, we can choose to not hide ourselves away um, when we feel broken and weak. And, you know, I mean, uh, one, one spot you can see this, I know that, that you and I are both concerned about depths of despair. Um, those often tend to follow on some loss in status, right? Like you lose a job, yeah. you, your status in the community falls and you respond by isolating yourself, like pulling, pulling inside yourself, not answering phone calls anymore. And then eventually it escalates and you end up killing yourself in one way or another. But that's um, not inevitable is what you argue. No, it's not. I think there's lots of incentives and structures and cultural assumptions pushing us that way. Um, and I think they are in, definitely bound up in a lot of the ways that our economy works and a lot of the ways our economy grows. I think it, it, it works in ways that tend to dispose us in bad directions like, like this. But you could be a full participant in this economy. And then when you lose your job, you could have the resources, philosophical, religious, personal, emotional, to say like, you know, I'm going to sort of make peace with my state. I'm going to, you know, try to better it, but like, I'm not going to hide away. I'm not going to drink myself into oblivion. Um, so, yeah, I, but I think that, that to live richly, you just do need to face hard stuff. And there's just so it's, it's a lot easier for us now than I think it's ever been for humans to try to paper over necessary hard stuff, hide away from it. Yeah, no. And um, first on the, the loss and shame and, and all that stuff. One piece of research I saw, I thought it was, I, I learned it through Brad Wilcox, um, but it had to do with the, the Christian church in America. Okay. And that in, you look around at, well, to go back, I have a daughter who used to listen to a Christian rock station and I, I hated that stuff. And it was a mistake. If you have young kids don't, and you're, you're a Christian, don't let them listen to Christian rock music. It's not the gateway to Bach. It's the gateway to Justin Bieber, okay? So learn from my mistakes. Don't do that. But what I liked about, the DC, about DC's Christian rock station is that the little promos for the station were all people telling stories like, you know, there was a time I had children and I abandoned them. And I went off and I thought I was going to find satisfaction in, you know, living a wild life or, or anything else. And I found that my satisfaction was in Jesus. And mm -hmm. every, every promotion thing was from somebody who was broken. Okay. And it made it very clear that, that Christianity is, is a field hospital out in the world. Yet, for white people in America, you increasingly only show up when you have your life together. And so this was a research. Right. When a white Christian in America loses his job, he becomes less likely to show up at church. Mm -hmm. You're afraid right. to show up at the one place that should be most welcoming for the least among these. Sure. This uh, wasn't true outside of, you know, among African-Americans. I don't remember about Hispanics, but among African-Americans, the men actually became more likely <laughs> to show up mm -hmm. at church, um, yeah. which is, a, a, to me, a better reflection of what Christianity is supposed to be. So that idea, that's just one example of if you don't have your life together, you hide away, clearly not being something that's, it might be innate that you're ashamed, but it's not necessary that that shame would, would dominate Absolutely and cause, right. cause that outcome. Yeah, no, there, I read a, a study recently that, that, um, that experimenters were working with a, a particular group of, of monkeys and um, 
what they found was that low status monkeys had this tendency to self isolate. And that mm -hmm. also if you offered cocaine to all the monkeys that only the low status ones would self administer that the high status ones wouldn't. Right. And you can just like see the, the parallels, you know, immediately. Um, so I, I do think there's something probably hardwired about mm -hmm. that, but absolutely cultural kind of, um, incentives, you know, or, or assumptions push and pull us in different directions. And so then the other the other pushback you would get um, from some of the cultural left would sort of be, I mean, we were sort of joking on Twitter this morning. I, I have a piece up on the examiner called, you know, the, I think it's called the, the anti-nuclear family people are half right. Um, and that half right because um, you have uh, in your in your essay on the money culture, you put what I might have cast as a sort of idyllic ideal of, you know, a breadwinner going off to his reliable factory job, coming home, coaching T-ball while his w wife is in the PTA and spends her day raising the kids. You put that as like a, you know, a, a halfway down the slippery slope. You're already going to Hades at that point. Um, and then we at the same time have people saying, the family is an oppressive structure and parent right. is, you know, uh, is a tyrannical uh, structure, et cetera. Um, right. And so the idea that, you know, when we had marriage without no fault divorce, that when we have strong uh, nuclear families or even further, and we'll get to the um, some of your critique of uh, the nuclear families in a second, but I want to ask when we have tightly knit communities, with strong expectations and rules that that is suffocating. That was the number one criticism I heard of alienated America is that I'm praising, you know, these Mormon places or these Dutch reformed places. And these writers are saying, I couldn't wait to get out of sure. Orange City, Iowa. I couldn't wait to get out of, uh, you know, where I grew up in Utah because all these expectations were oppressing me, were imposing values on me, especially if it's a, you know, a gay person or somebody who, for whatever reason, doesn't feel they fit in. Um, so yeah. are you, is your sort of pushing back against autonomy, harming people who might not fit in and might feel suffocated? I'm asking you to respond to the criticism of my book, but it's also a criticism. I'll take care of it, Tim. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think that holding a group of humans together especially under conditions where survival is not like at stake, mm -hmm. right? Where like, I don't need to stick with the group so that I don't get eaten by a tiger or something. Um, it's hard and it requires us um, to submit to some things that are not ideal for us, right? You're not gonna realize your full self in every sort of public event. The way you're, you're meant to comport yourself in certain settings is like not that fun, doesn't feel very natural. So I, I would say that like, Belonging to community requires some wiggle room on your on the individual's part, right? You have to kind of adjust yourself a little bit, but not every cohesive community is equally repressive, right? Yep. Um, and, you know, I, I suspect, I generally think people are, are pretty smart deep down. And I suspect that if a whole generation defected from 1950s America and from that sort of from the outside in some ways, very idyllic setting that, that probably there are ways we are running our, our public life that weren't so good and weren't, weren't so humane. Um, mm -hmm. So I would want to press like on, um, you know, some of those communities and just sort of ask whether there are ways that you can have the cohesion um, and have a little bit more wiggle room for eccentrics and outsiders and people who don't fit quite right. Again, you're never going to be able to get perfect everyone feels entirely like their whole self belongs here but i think there's better and worse yeah. which is a you know easy for me to say probably quite hard to do in practice i mean my my two thoughts are one the people who didn't fit in in that you know evangelical or whatever town and left are disproportionately likely to have bylines <laughs> and sure. um and be professors etc so that that's part of it um but B, I think sort of the American dream, American exceptionalism here is that we all belong to many things at the same time. That okay. sort of, to, I'm gonna adapt uh, Yuval Levin's uh, language from his book, A Time to Build, but that we find our identity in the role that we play. And we play in, within 
things that we belong to. Yeah. We belong to many things in America. Like yep. uh, you have a workplace, you have a family. Hopefully it's not just those two. Hopefully there are third places. There's a, a regular pub you go to. There's a parish you belong to, a PTA, um, you know, a, a neighborhood swimming pool. And these have overlap, but they also have differences. And you play mm -hmm. different roles in different things. So yeah. somebody who just feels, I don't really have a role yeah. sitting here in uh, this, uh, this church pew will have a role you know, in their, their neighborhood swimming pool in, you know, at the, yeah. at the coffee shop, et cetera. And then that pluralism that, you know, of, of civic and religious and, and social and, and all that stuff. And that we have subsidiarity and we have villages and towns and counties and yeah. churches and parishes, and there's multiple levels and sizes. Tocqueville wrote about like the, the, some of these are trivial. Some of these are big, some of these are small, right. some of these are sublime, that that is what can allow the eccentric to breathe even if because they don't just belong to one thing ideally right so there could be sort of pressure valves or something you know like the the, the grungy jazz club down the yeah. street is a place where you can get away um and kind of be different yeah that seems right and probably mm -hmm. that is how communities ever hold together <laughs> yeah. right? it's like you have spots where you can exercise different parts of yourself uh, but but as you write about like and as you know for whatever its faults, like the, you know, the book Bowling Alone, what it shows is that there's a pretty whole scale like withdrawal from a lot of those belongings. So there yep. seems to be something going on. And a lot of it is just that the greatest generation was unusually civic because they won the world war and they came home and everyone was rich all of a sudden. And like, it was easy to kind of, for mm -hmm. them to kind of slot in and, and be, be joiners. Um, but you know, there, ah, it seems like we're swinging in a, a, a different direction much worse and I mean we need to think about why like why don't people feel at home in their local pub in yep. the jazz club in the church it's it's a it's got to be a complicated answer um, but it's a it's a big one yeah and, and uh, we'll get to that though I want your brief against um, again the, the factory worker in 1955 had a yep. job for 30 years um, his wife was able to stay at home the civic involvement was through the roof 1960 was the peak of uh church attendance of volunteering of, of t-ball and little league and all that stuff um and so again we not it's not just conservatives like me it's a lot of liberals also say hey you know let's get those 90 percent tax rates back let's do all that you mm -hmm. what's your brief against against that i guess returning to the 50s yeah uh it couldn't reproduce itself um for whatever reason the vision of life that was operative there was utterly uncompelling to its children. Um, mm -hmm. So, so that's already a strike against it there. Um, and we could try to dial back in some senses, but you would find yourself at war with very powerful economic interests, yep. right? Like a lot of it is that it, you know, if, if you're thinking about commerce in a purely shareholder value sort of framework, then, then shutting down the factory and shipping it overseas um, and paying dirt cheap labor, like just makes a ton of sense. Um, so I'm all for trying to find ways to rein that back in and push back against that. Um, I mean, as a conservative, how far can you go in that, in that regard to get the fifties back? Like how heavy, how, how heavy of a state hand are you willing yeah. to tolerate to kind of make GM behave and make it outlaw not the robots. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Outlaw the robots. Um, or, or what, I mean, like stand up a new WPA and start paying out of work people to like make beautiful bridges on the Merritt Parkway. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Um, I, Merritt Parkway is a great little signal there to your, your New England brethren. Um, <laughs> it was, it's one of the great roads to drive on up there. We've got the Taconic, the Merritt, uh, running alongside the godless I-95, um, and New York state Thruway, But, uh, so let's talk about that. The forces that, um, that draw us out of, um, out of family, out of community, et cetera. Sometimes reading your, some of your recent essays, I was thinking of Wendell Berry. And I almost sure. think of if you wanted to, um, if you were like a, an enemy army trying to pick off the enemies, you would try to separate them. And to some extent, if you're just a, a capitalist trying to sell people stuff, um, 
you yeah. want them isolated. Is that, is that a way you see it? Say more. Absolutely. I think on both ends, I think, you know, you want a, a, you know, a, a, an incredibly agile workforce, right? That can stay late if you need them to, that can move if you need them to. Um, and so you want them as unembedded as possible, I think, to make them mm -hmm. kind of portable and flexible and malleable. Um, and then, yeah, you want people alone so that you can sell them stuff. <laughs> so, so Christopher Lash, who I think we both admire, he has a great quote that I, I quote in at least one of those recent pieces where he says that, um, that advertising in the modern age doesn't just tell you that like the shoes are good and they'll last you a long time. It kind of, it sells you this idea that like the reason why you're lonely is because you don't have these shoes, right? <laughs> so like it, it actually has an incentive to make you lonely and to make you believe that everyone else is having more fun and is better off than you and you are sort of pathetic. But were you to dress this way or drive this car or whatever, things would be okay. So I think there's, there's yeah, tremendous incentive to keep us isolated and starving for approval, for belonging. Yeah. Um, the, so uh, again, reminding people, send in questions over Twitter, use the hashtag AI Solidarity by email nicole.pen at AI.org. Um, so <clears throat> the problem with critiques of sort of capitalism, free enterprise, et cetera, is that again, aren't you critiquing the free choices made by people? That you and I think people ought to live a certain way. I think people you know, should get married, go to church, um, pray every weekend and have uh, as, as many kids as they can fit inside their house. But um, if people disagree, who am I to tell them that they're, they're doing the wrong thing? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you should absolutely tell people how to live. I think we all should. Um, I think that it's, I'll exaggerate a little. It's, it's hard to imagine a greater unkindness than to believe that you know how to live well and flourish and then let your neighbors just absolutely ruin their lives. Um, so yeah, I think that one, um, one bad thing that happened, especially post-war in America, is that we got the idea that you're supposed to sort of privatize your deep-seated philosophical, religious, ethical beliefs yep. and kind of um, run your own house that way, but don't impose on others. I think that there's no problem with telling people what to do <laughs> if you do it in a loving, good way, right? So I found that over a, a decade of teaching that my students respond best when I'm assertive about what I think. And I do it in a way that is obviously like tolerant of, you know, they're perfectly welcome to push back on me and, and I welcome it. Um, but, you know, I, I think if you just kind of stand back and you're like, well, who knows? There's like, you know, it could be one, could be the other. Like they kind of disengage. They don't care. You don't have anything to tell them. Um, but if you you press on them and kind of make them defend their, their point of view yep. and, and do a follow-up question where you say, but no, but you're wrong for this reason, they respond beautifully. All right. And and the thing I'm I, I say this sometimes, the thing I'm proudest of in my teaching career is that I always get almost perfect scores on the question of, of does the instructor uh, respect the students? And you wouldn't necessarily know it if you saw the transcript because I'm like cussing them out and I'm telling them that what they're saying doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Um, but they appreciate that because I have something that I'm trying to say to them and I care enough about them to say it. So um, solutions, uh, you in your money culture, you offer a few. Um, yeah. Are they reasonable? Do you actually think these can happen? Tell us. So tell us Actually, what they are and then oh, tell us no. what you think they can have. <laughs> I might forget them. Um, so uh, paying, paying uh, a mom or a dad to stay at home was one of them. Now, first I mean, of all, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interrupt here. I think um, the, the data shows, we talked about autonomy earlier, so I'm not going to settle on autonomy, but the data shows that more women want to be working less than they currently are. Right. More women are full-time than want to be. And then um, a lot of women are part-time who want to be full-time at home with children. So yep. if you care about autonomy, you should say, all right, I wish more women were able to choose to work at home, to uh, work as, as caregivers more to their own children than currently are. But also I would argue that communities need stay-at-home moms and stay-at-home dads, um, people who will sit on the front porch and yell at the kids being idiots or help yeah, the kid yeah. as skinned as me. Um, I don't have great solutions as to how to make that happen. There's a lot yeah. of debate about it, but you go ahead on that one. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I so I think we agree that like more parents spending more time with children would be a, a gain for everything for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, and whether we can make that happen, I mean, so you see on the kind of like far left or in American terms, the far left, people like Bernie Sanders and Liz Warren have made this part of their platform that instead of just plowing money into like universal daycare or something, we should have the option that you can get a voucher to get paid to stay home and watch your kid during their sort of neediest years. Um, I think that would be quite good. Could we pull it off? Um, and as far as like nutty left wing ideas go, um, this one probably has more potential to get broad support than others. Um, I think, you know, conservatives like rightly are, you know, quite enamored of the idea of children being raised by their mom or their dad. Um, so I don't know. I mean, it's not going to happen in the Biden administration um, mm -hmm. and it may not happen anytime soon. It's not entirely crazy to imagine that this could work on, in the American context. Yeah. And, and that what you're saying is, is different and importantly different than simply subsidizing paid childcare. Because right. right the Biden administration, one of the top economists they just picked up, Heather Boucher, is very explicit that her way to help helping to help working parents is to subsidize paid childcare. And there right. are people who even say we'd be better off if we had more if more children spending more time being ca cared for by professionals. And that's right. One of those points that I don't even know that I could argue against that person because it seems so wrong. But you, you and I don't have a, a, a disagreement on that, I don't think. No. But again, helping working parents, some like that at least some of it should include helping them give up their paid job yeah. and, and be at home and, right. and on the front porch and in the playground, et cetera. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And I mean, I, so this is a spot where maybe you and I differ, but I, I read recently that in 1950, you had to work approximately 60 hours at minimum wage to pay the average month's rent. And that mm -hmm. now you have to work about 320 hours of minimum wage to pay the average month's rent. So wages, and that's just one measure of many mm -hmm. that like wages have not kept pace with productivity. And that like the family wage is like, a very it's a rare and beautiful thing <laughs> um and yeah. so ways to try to bring that back and i don't know like you know our, our workforce now has, has doubled right like you know there's there's lots of pressures pushing wages down right with you know yep. capitalists have lots of resources to kind of get cheap labor from different places i don't know exactly how you would run at it but i think if you could try to find a way to pull wages up that could also be helpful and one argument might be uh, we're forming and strengthening unions, but again, absolutely. That, yeah, absolutely. Um, so the you wrote similar to David Brooks. David Brooks wrote the nuclear family was a mistake. He was not arguing that people shouldn't be raised by parents, but that families should be embedded in in clans, as you put. I think so so yeah. say say more on that. Um, and and could is there something you could do, or we could do, or the people watching this could do? to help provide more clans to support families? Well, we could not tuck our parents off in nursing homes. Um, we could be open to the, the relative loss of autonomy and comfort that would come from having your, your parents live with you. Um, I think that's a good and beautiful thing that's quite accessible for a lot of us. And it's actually, things are trending in that direction right now. Um, and there's, there are more people more home builders who are being asked to move to build homes with mother-in-law apartments and stuff, stuff like that. So I think that that's an easy and very good thing that you can do. Um, what was the other thing I was going to say? I'm going to quickly, well, you I'll remember that now. pipe in on the, the mother-in-law apartment. Yeah. It's interesting because you don't just put mom in another bedroom, like your kids, right? right. She maybe has her own kitchen and privacy. And this is a real important part that I found. The more I talk about building community and family, and that, the, I, I had a priest ask me, he said, what should our, I said, didn't, hasn't a parish, a Catholic parish, lost some of its purpose? Because we have, you know, we used to feed all the hungry people here, and now there are government programs for that. We used to run the youth sports, and now, especially in suburban D.C., there's these, like, elite companies that are going to train your sons to get their, and daughters to get their D1 scholarships, etc. And he said, well, we're supposed to fill unmet needs. What is the unmet need of mm -hmm. the people in this parish? We live in the suburbs, you know, the last metro stop. So it's almost all parents. And he says, what is the unmet need of your middle class, upper middle class suburban parents in this area? And I said, 
We need a place to bring our kids and ignore them while we hang out with other adults. But that aspect, that loving our kids means getting distance from them. Bringing mom yeah. into our house means building her, her own place with, with a separate wall. That That's a, a really difficult thing for us to talk about, that we're not talking about autonomy and independence and everybody gets to do their own thing. We're all together, but all together doesn't have to be this all-consuming thing. And during this COVID lockdown, oh gosh, every time somebody like me, my, my friends Seth and, uh, Seth and Bethany Mandel live in the same area, we said, open the schools, open the summer camps. And we'd get some tweeter being like, I'm sorry, you actually have to spend time with your kids now. <laughs> I want to punch them in the face. I'm like, hey, like, you spend the time with my kids. B, my yeah. kids are awesome. I wish I was with them now sledding. But th that loving requires distance. Sure. Sure. No, absolutely. Um, yeah, I think that there's actually one thing that can change and should change is, is there's actually a lot of building codes that, that push back against the building of those yep. sorts of attached things. And that's just foolishness. And that should be that should be eliminated quickly, um, ideally. Montgomery um, County, Maryland had basically a ban on them and is, is liberalizing in that's that That's great. And I think another thing is, um, you know, remote work is not that much fun. I would much rather be speaking to in person right now. But um, we, the kind of, the concentration of good jobs that we see in a few super zips that sort of drives real estate prices through the roof there and kind of causes yeah. a sort of money and brain drain from other parts of the country is disastrous. And, you know, t I think Twitter and a number of other companies recently announced that like remote work will remain an option um, for employees after COVID is over. I think if we can turn tech in that direction, that would be wonderful. Cause if you had the option to do your yeah. fancy job back in your hometown, living cheaply, living near the, your family and the people you grew up with, I think that's a choice a lot of people would make. So but this, and this is what regard. we were, yeah, this is what we were promised 20 years ago and it didn't happen. The opposite right. happened, right? Austin, San Francisco, et cetera, um, all, all drew the, the more of the brain power. And then the, the Charles Murray argument that I buy and that I uh, rest some of alienated America on is um, that what happened is now in Bethesda, Maryland and Greenwich, Connecticut, there was like too many PTA moms and too <laughs> many little league coaches, right? Yeah. Like the coaches are like, I don't need 11 assistant coaches, right? Meanwhile, yeah. back in Newton, Iowa, all the, the PTA moms and coaches left. So yep. while Twitter might suffer from losing the face-to-face -face contact of, of being a colleague, Newton, right. Iowa might benefit. And I know which one I'm rooting for. Yeah, and their, their economies could benefit and it could become less like oppressive to afford an apartment or a house in a place like Greenwich or Cambridge. Um, so I hope, I, I don't know exactly where it will go. And you, you know, Zuckerberg did announce that like he was going to prorate um, salaries. Like if you move to yeah. Iowa, he's going to pay you less because he's, uh, I won't yeah. say what he is. But, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's maybe a spot where, where some progress could happen. Yeah. Um, there's an irony in that, but anyway, so we're, we're starting to get questions now. Um, one question is about LBJ's great society. And okay. in, in my book, I paint that as a source of that drives the simultaneous over centralization and hyper individualism that, you know, Tocqueville warned about that. A lot of people have talked about that over centralizing the safety net, um, has made fewer people go to church, uh, but fewer people started to death at the same time. <laughs> so anyway, you, uh, you I think, are, are less allergic to uh, federal intervention in people's lives than I am. So I want your, your take on I mean, I, Great Society. I still think that local charity is better, right? Because in addition to getting enough food to live on, you have the sense that someone cares about you and like you can see yes. their face and they're doing it because they want you to live <laughs> um, and not because it's their sort of bureaucratic job to kind of send you a check. Um, but whether you know, the direction of the causality, I think I need convincing on, and I'd love to hear your sort of quick argument to that effect that, um, you know, the turning over of, or the taking up of charitable work by centralized authorities causes mm -hmm. the fracturing and isn't a response to the fracturing. Um, so if it, if it's causing the fracturing, then then that'll make me think. Um, but if it's just a response, then I'm like, well, no, it's not ideal to just get a check. Uh, yeah. But it's a hell of a lot better than starving. Well, I, I would say two things. I'd say one, nationalizing the safety net allows for 
two good things um, that, and one is redistributing from really wealthy places to poor places. There's right. places in Mississippi where the nearest people with a significant extra cash are a hundred miles away. And, you know, while it's Stanford, Connecticut, it's pretty easy yeah. for, to stock the soup kitchens there. Number right. two is the federal government with it's a, because it prints its own money, et cetera, right. can be counter cyclical while charities right. are cyclical. My church has less money to feed hungry people when the economy crashes and there's more. So that's a benefit, but that, that could allow the, federal safety net to be a sort of safety net of safety nets, right? Still having it administered on the local level. Yeah. The closest thing I have to, to proof, um, it's a study, and it's a bit of a cute study that I cite in Alienated America. And it's, um, it was showing that during the, the New Deal, um, the congressional districts of appropriators had greater drop-off in church charity than the congressional districts of less powerful members so in other words federal money coming in yeah. for exogenous reasons led to a greater uh, retraction of private uh charity again it's it's study's cute but it, yeah. it certainly points in the direction that um that government aid causes um uh this retreat that said that's not an excuse for churches to continue to retreat <laughs> Um, right. you still need to, and during COVID, you see it. If you come into Silver Spring, you'll see these weird traffic jams. You don't understand what's happening. It's free food being handed out at churches of every stripe where they're right. just saying, okay, we're going to, we're going to feed anybody. You don't have to demonstrate need. You show up, we throw you food. And that I think is, is the proper reaction to the great society is say, okay, we're still going to do whatever there's demand for. Yes. Yeah. And I mean, I, I, I don't know about your study. It does sound cute. Um, but I wouldn't want to need to deny for a second that one thing that pulls us into healthy communities is need. Um, and that you would get slightly more people getting embedded in communities that would be healthy for them in 10 ways if they need that community yep. um, for economic reasons, for health reasons. Um, so I could imagine there would be a little bit of fall off in church um, church attendance if, if you don't need the, the food. I still, I, I think I still want everyone to have the food. <laughs> but it's, it's not just not needing the food. It's that the church provides you with the opportunity to love your neighbor. It's mm -hmm. the, the people who mm -hmm. show up right. and hand out the food right. who are being brought in by that. But yes, at least it's a trade-off, right? Like that, and, and when we see that alienation leads to deaths of despair, it's not just that Aunt Gertrude doesn't have as many volunteer hours. It's that now Aunt Gertrude's other nephew is also alienated from church and life is anyway i want to get to a couple more questions I, I, oh. um uh mentioned bowling alone yep. in addition to that um the one of the questions uh points to his research that and the the questions phrase very well so I'll, I'll quote it neighborhoods and communities that are in the midst of demographic change and that are becoming increasingly diverse face challenges as it relates to social cohesion yeah. Um, and I think that's really well phrased because some of the people trying to refute Putnam on this said it's not diversity that reduces cohesion. It's uh, the change that it's rapid mm -hmm. changes yeah, to a yeah. community that uh, reduces cohesion, which to me is in a refutation so much as maybe a correction. Um, but also, interestingly, it wasn't that when a bunch of Salvadorans move into a previously Irish neighborhood, the Irish people don't trust the Salvadorans as much as they trusted the old Irish people. The Irish Americans don't trust one another yeah. as much. And the Salvadorans in that neighborhood are less likely to have trust. Uh, the, and Putnam called it the turtle pulling his head back in. It was a real retrenchment. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I think it's an endlessly interesting topic and I, I'd like your thoughts. Um, you know, I, I thought, um, I didn't know that that, uh, that it was seriously contested. The idea that diversity poses difficulties for social cohesion and for welfare spending and stuff. It upset um, so a lot I, of people. Yeah, but I thought it was still pretty sort of on solid footing in terms of just like the social science. So if that's not right, I actually, I couldn't really respond to the-, to the I, I, I think it is, I think it is right. But again, the, the distinction and uh, the reason I, I like the phrasing of the question is from James Rather, is that the, the closest thing to a strong counter argument is that if the diversity is 
long established over generations, then maybe you have the social trust. Mm -hmm. But it's when, I mean, I use gentrification as one of the examples in my book of, of that's yeah. the same, just like the Salvadorans moving into your neighborhood and you lose your burger joint for uh, yeah. a pu pusseria. Um, if all the white people are moving into your part of Brooklyn, um, that's the same sort of thing that you have norms that might be very local that are yeah. being upset and that this is what leads to the loss of uh, cohesion. I, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I imagine, yeah. I imagine it must be both. Um, and, you know, I do think that, um, you know, there isn't such a thing as pure Salvadorian culture, right? Like, yeah, it is always a mix of some stuff that got smashed together, you know, 25 or 100 years ago. So we do adjust and we can adjust and we, we should adjust and just be careful about how we do it. You know, like that's, that's kind of a boring non-answer, but, but it, it probably yeah. it seems right to me. All right. I'm, uh, what's the effect of uh, the pandemic and the shutdowns mm. and the, the, you know, Main Street is emptying out. We're not supposed to hang out with other families. Yeah. A lot of kids aren't going to school. Yeah. What's the effect? Is there, is there a bright side to this? Is it all a disaster? Is it all going to be normal again in six months? I bet it won't be normal again in six months. Um, I think we're being starved in some ways uh, for some healthy stuff. Um, you know, we already had a pretty limited diet, relatively speaking, of, yep. you know, like interacting with strangers in your neighborhood, like banding together to do stuff. Um, you know, already um, digital connectivity was um, displacing some of our face-to-face -face contact in which, and I think face-to-face -face contact is much richer and better and more important. Um, so we're being starved of it. And you and I are speaking like this now that could catapult us out, like out of a cannon afterwards mm -hmm. and motivate kind of make stark and unmissable. The fact that you miss a lot when you're not we'll all start hugging our neighbors once we're allowed to, even if we never had before. It's going to be disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I, I could imagine some of us being kind of catapulted into these different kinds of, of interactions, I hope. Um, some of us might get accustomed because it is really so easy and frictionless to get your meal ordered in yep. and to spend your evening watching Netflix and maybe chat a little bit on a social media site with friends and relatives far away. No, and um, that's... that's <laughs> for community uh nisbet this defined alienation not just as being detached from society but not seeing the point in it mm. and this is mm. one of the implications in a lot of what you're writing is that people are choosing poorly <laughs> um people you know they're yeah. maybe it's not their fault maybe they're pressured into it maybe it wasn't clear what the choice is but it's very likely that even though it will be more clear than ever to some extent that you need other people physically. It yeah. will be easier than ever. I mean, I was just reading a, a friend of mine, Zach Carter wrote a, a book about John Maynard Keynes and said, whenever his brain was stuck, he would go for a walk. Mm -hmm. I am perfectly capable of going for a walk every time my brain is stuck, but yeah. instead I check Twitter, <laughs> right? Yeah. I am making the wrong decision every time I do that because it is, um, because it is frictionless to, to use yeah. your phrase. So isn't it's it possible so that this pandemic will just make us, we'll fit a little more comfortably into our couch and we'll, we'll see our neighbors less. Yeah, and I, you know, we only each have a certain number of jobs, like your job and to some extent mine is to think and write in public about this stuff. Um, and I, I think like these products are so beautifully made, right? Mm -hmm. Like they pull you, like I feel a physical... <laughs> Like pull to yeah. go and check something like Twitter when I have a moment of boredom. Um, and, I, and I think one thing that we should do is we should build a certain amount of healthy adversarialism into our relationship with these companies. Because, you know, I say in one of these pieces, every year, a lot of the smartest people who graduate from college, they go to Silicon Valley and they put all of their <laughs> smarts and all of their long, long hours of work into making Twitter more irresistible to Tim, yeah. to, to Tim Carney. Um, and so they're playing you like a fiddle. <laughs> And like, I don't know, you know, to, 
to what end in your case? Like, I don't think I buy much stuff as a result of my addiction to Twitter, but that is the sort of upshot is like, it pull you in, it makes you needy. And then it shows you exactly the stuff that might, that kind of promises you in particular, um, some kind of healing or some kind of belonging. Yeah. So I think we should instigate like a more skeptical attitude and, and kind of just keep telling people they're getting manipulated um, and how much ground that will make for us, I don't know, but it's, it's one thing. No, and that's, um, that leads into one of the next questions. Certainly, I, it's true that Silicon Valley tries to make apps and devices more addictive. That, yeah. that seems clearly true. But when you were talking earlier, positing sort of nefarious intent, um, yeah. is, is that an overstatement? I mean, I've met Zuckerberg. He did not seem evil. I mean, Bezos yeah. does look like the, the comic book villain, um, but on the other hand, he hasn't, you know, tried to control the, he's, you know, shut down all the main streets, but he couldn't, if he were really the evil villain, wouldn't he have pressed the button already to do stuff? And just in general, like we don't buy conspiracy theories. We think that, you know, companies try to make a profit. Yeah. Are they really thinking long-term to try to isolate us, pull us away from church, et cetera? No, no, they're not thinking about that at all. Um, what they're thinking about is maximizing shareholder value. And there's an ideology that's been regnant for the past several decades that says that that is your job when you're CEO of something is mm -hmm. maximizing the value of your stocks, right? And like, you can stop there. If you did that today, you can sleep well, right? You don't, it's not your job to moralize. It's not your job to wonder what impact you're having on your users and your community. Like, it's just not relevant. Well, right? And that, that's, that's the key to, I think, a lot of what you're saying, the divorce of the, the, the schizophrenia, that you can do something as part of your job right. that's different from you trying to be a good person. <laughs> Absolutely. So Charles Taylor, again, my, my hero, has said that you know for some centuries now, there's been this expected division between public and private life where public life is perfectly rationalized and neutral and private life is a place where we have our stormy passions and our loyalties and all of that. But that your fiduciary duty as a public actor is to act in a purely rational utility yeah. maximizing manner. And I think that like the kind of codification of shareholder primacy in the end of the 20th century, um, it just sort of like made that really explicit that like your only responsibility as CEO is maximizing shareholder value. And so again, it's just not on the table for you. So no, they don't want to make, they doesn't hate us, but he doesn't love us either. <laughs> well, but so, I mean, but some of that, div that divorce between different parts of us is, well, again, Yuval, my, my colleague, boss at AEI, talks about we have certain roles in certain jobs yeah. and yep. uh, implicit criticism of the, the tech reporter at the New York Times is that it's not her role to try to make sure that Tom Cotton doesn't end up on the op-ed page, right? Mm -hmm. It's not our, it's not the, um, the clothing company's role yeah. to make sure that we're promoting whatever the, the, the new woke thing is, that right. we are supposed to play, be role players, which sometimes means, you know, doing, anyway, do you think there's a contradiction between the argument that we ought to play roles and your argument to meld the public and private? I, I mean, I think, um, you know, I probably don't want my lawyer like crying on my shoulder about his <laughs> love life or something. Like some amount of professionalism, I think probably is salutary. Um, so that's, you know, we could say that much, but we, we also should, should say that, you know, I, I think you might actually quote this from Aristotle in your book that like we are what we repeatedly do and yep. we need to pay attention to the fact that if you are pulled into a culture of like you know, this high prestige, it's a huge part of your self identity and it, it kind of demands and inculcates certain behavior patterns over 50 hours a week, 60 hours a week, it does shape you, right? And it, yep. it, does, it does change who you are in an important way um, so that I don't think it's reasonable to expect that you could have a public sphere defined by kind of raw calculating ruthlessness and have that not leak into other parts of our lives um, and, and in toxic ways. No, um, I think that's right. Um, I used to joke that I'm a, a libertarian from nine to five and a conservative on the weekends and after hours. And a friend of mine at Reason Magazine said, that he knows a lot of uh, a lot of uh, Christian pre preachers who are the opposite, that they're uh, libertarians on the weekends and, mm -hmm. and after hours, and that mine is better. But increasingly, I'm thinking I have to be, you know, uh, 
more more conservative nine to five as well. Um, anyway, in thank you for joining me. Thanks for yeah. writing the, the essays that you're writing. I encourage people start with the. I mean, you're we're entering Christmas vacation, guys. If you have access to a printer, to PDF, his essay on money culture. I don't agree with all of it. We got into some of it. Print it off. Read it. Um, follow. Keep following Ian um, in his work. Keep following AEI. Thank you very much for joining us and enjoy the rest of your Wednesday. Thanks a lot, Tim.